This morning, uh, and, and again, I've already said something about it, but I'll say some more now. About We begin a month of prayer and fasting here, okay? January, we've set it aside as prayer and fasting month. On Monday nights, I want to encourage you to join in. I want to encourage you to participate, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But I want us to uh, participate as a congregation. It's not something Pastor Tim is doing. It's not something that the elders are doing. This is something that, as a congregation, as a church body, we need to be doing. Uh, and and with 2020, uh, and I'm not alone in this, there's a lot of people who are th- saying, you know, something... You know, this is more than just a tearing off of a calendar. This is more than just a new new year ahead of us. Something is afoot. Something is taking place. And, and we're in the threshold of a new decade. And, and even while I say that, people, and, and some of you know that, that, okay, something is happening. Something is happening. And so I think it's important. How many of you know that prayer and fasting do not twist God's arm? That's not why we do it. But prayer and fasting is a way of getting our hearts in the right place so that God can do what God already wants to do. Prayer and fasting is a way of getting out of God's way. It is. It's a way of getting out of God's way. Bill Bright, uh, I believe he's the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, but he also has written a little pamphlet called Seven Basic Steps of Fasting, uh, which is a classic as far as I'm concerned. But he says in the opening paragraphs of that little booklet, he says, I believe that the power of fasting as it relates to prayer is the spiritual atomic bomb that our Lord has given us to destroy the strongholds of evil and usher in a great revival and a spiritual harvest and renewal yes. here at Trinity at the Eastern Gate. Now, he didn't add that part. I added that last part. Amen. But really, that's what this is about. Yes, you know, how, how many of you know that there are strongholds of evil? That there are strongholds that have, a, that have a grip upon us and upon our church and upon our individual lives and upon our families and upon our community. And those strongholds need to be pulled down in the name of Jesus. This is not business as usual. This is not the same old, same old. This is a brand new year and God is up to something. He's up to something. As some of you know, my one word, and I'd encourage you, and I've been hearing from some of you, said, well, I've got my word. God told me what, what my word is. Well, and and it's, it's, it's interesting how that these words are tremendous words because I know a little bit about you. But the word that the Lord gave me, and, and I believe for our church, is the word resurrection. And as some of you know, I'm still trying to unpack what that means. I told you last week that resurrection does not mean resuscitation. What's the difference? Well, resusc- both of them bring people back from the dead, okay? Resuscitation and resurrection are bringing back to life. The problem is resuscitation brings us back to our old life resuscitation brings us back to our old fears and our old habits and our old way of thinking but resurrection oh no 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 it's a brand new life it's a brand new day it's a brand new power and we need resurrection we don't need a resuscitation we don't need a resuscitation we need a resurrection Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If anyone be in Christ, they are a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You know what? Sometimes we don't understand that verse because we're thinking resuscitation. No, no, no. He's thinking of resurrection. And whatever the future has for this church, whatever the future God has for this church, it, as, as good as the past was, our future does not look like the past. Our future is a resurrection, not a resuscitation. Bill Bright continues in that little booklet. He says, increasingly, he said, I have been gripped with a growing sense of urgency. And I share that with you this morning. I feel a sense of urgency. I feel a sense of urgency to call upon God. That's why we're doing the prayer and fasting. 
It's a, it's a time for us to come together, and I encourage you, if you got Monday nights free, come and join us, at least for one of them. Come and pray and, and join in that urgency to call upon God to send revival to our church. I encourage you to join and participate. Now, some people may say, well, you know, what do I, how do I fast? Well, uh, you can fast one meal a day. Or one meal for one day. You know, you can fast uh, one day out of the week. You can fast two or three days in the month. You can fast one week. You can fast. There's uh, several combinations of how you want to do it. I'd encourage you to, if you're not used to fasting, I'd encourage you to start slowly. Don't get discouraged. The enemy's going to, trust me, when you start to fast, when you start to have a serious prayer time, when you start to seek the Lord, I guarantee the enemy is going to try to stop you, and discourage you, and talk you out of it. Come on, sir. You're talking truth. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. You're talking truth, sir. Don't let him talk you out of it. Don't let him discourage you. Even if you fail and fall, that's all right. God knows. God's got it. Amen. But I'd also encourage you when you start to fast, increase when you're denying yourself Increase your prayer. Increase your time in the Word of God. Some may say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure I can fast uh, food. I'm not sure I can fast. I'm on medications that prevent me from fasting food. That's okay. There's other ways of fasting. You know, sometimes, and and this one appeals to me uh, real well. uh, I fast, uh, I, I encourage you, you could fast an extra hour. That means getting up one hour, giving up one hour of sleep for the whole month. So if you get up at five, get up at four. If you get up at six, get up at five. On and on. Give up an hour of sleep. Because that's what fasting is. Fasting is denying self. Well, I need my beauty sleep. Well, listen, I believe you. (laughs) But give up an hour. And trust the Lord for the beauty, okay? Fast your internet or Facebook. That's another way some people fast. And maybe you say, I can't do that for a whole month. Okay, well, deny yourself for a little while. Fast TV. That would be a real good one. Fasting pop or self or soft drinks. That'd be another. Fast all sugar or all sweets. I don't, you know, there's all kinds of ways of fasting. Fast, you could even fast peanut butter. <laughs> I've quit preaching and gone to meddling, haven't I, Mike? That's what I thought. (laughs) Fasting is about denying self. And I'd encourage you, as you deny self, increase your prayer. Increase your time in the Word of God. And I'd encourage you to get a journal for the month of January and keep a journal as you pray and spend time and see what the Lord says. And write it down. You see, it is, and again, fasting is about preparing our hearts. It's also beneficial to our bodies, did you know that? And to our our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, as well as our spirit. So fasting is beneficial. That's why why the Bible encourages us to do that. Uh, Fasting is about self-denial. It's about surrendering. It's about raising our expectations on God. Not on ourselves. It prepares and positions us. Uh, and, and again, uh, as we as we pray and fast, we confess, we repent of what our sin, what sins the Lord shows us, can, the condition of our heart for a breakthrough. Fasting and prayer is about getting our hearts right with God and with one another. And ask the Lord to speak and show to us, show us. On these Monday nights, I, I told uh, uh, Jack and some of the elders, I hope that we have times of, of prophesying and sharing what God is showing us and telling us in 2020 and in this new decade. Our scripture lesson this morning is John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. Now I'm going to I'm going to read this slowly cuz I want to I want to interject and make sure we're all on this as we move through this passage. Who were those Greeks? The Greeks were not Jews. They were Gentiles. 
They were Gentiles. Why were they going up to Jerusalem? Why were they going up to the feast? Well, you might remember that in the temple, there was a part of the temple in Jerusalem called the Court of the Gentiles. So that's why these Greeks were here. They, they had already opened their hearts and they were already seeking God. How many of you know that when you start to seek the Lord, you will find him? And they were already opening up their hearts and they were seeking the Lord. And they, they heard about Jesus. And pick 21, verse, they said, they came to Philip. Now, Philip was, was, that's a Greek name, even though Philip was a Jew. Philip is a Greek name because Philip was from Galilee. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They came to Philip with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to Andrew Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Oh, I got to read that again. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever trusts me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Lord, bless your word. Those who hear it, those who read it, and all who receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 23, Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified meant, he said, he he was thinking of the cross and the resurrection. Because that's when the Son of Man was glorified. The Son of Man was glorified when he was lifted up on the cross to die for the sins of the whole world. To take your place and my place and to carry away our sins. And then he was, on the third day, he rose from the dead. That was what he meant when he said, uh, the, the hour has come for the Son of Man, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, to be glorified. The point, though, that I want to make beyond that is this. Jesus knew what time it was. He knew what time it was. He, he knew that the hour had come. And the question I want to ask you this morning on this first day of 2020, the first day of a brand new decade, do you know what time it is? Do you know how close it is to the Lord's return? Do you know that things are moving into place at an incredibly rapid pace? Do you know that the Lord is working in ways that are just, people just a few years ago never thought they'd ever see that happen? There's revival, there's persecution. There's hope, there's despair. There's all kinds of stuff happening all over the world. Do you know what time it is? Do you know how close it is for his return? Do you know it's time for us to synchronize our watches? It's time for us to know and get in alignment with what God is doing. What the Lord is up to. Jesus said, The hour has come. Those Greeks came looking for him. Philip and Andrew took him to Jesus. And what did Jesus say? The very first thing he said, the hour has come. And Jesus was saying, the time is now. And then he launches into this parable, the parable of the seed. He said, I tell you the truth. And then he says, the kernel of wheat... A kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. He says, unless it falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. It remains a single seed. In other words, and listen, you know all this. Every seed has been designed. It has a protective coating around it, doesn't it? 
It's got a shell around every seed. It's got, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, that's the way God designed it. That's the way, uh, but until that or unless that seed falls to the ground and dies and that protective shell, that outer shell, that, that which is limiting the seed, unless it breaks apart and is shed, nothing's going to happen. Are you listening to me, church? Jesus said it right there. That unless that seed with a protective... And and listen, it it was designed for that. The protection around the seed was designed for that. But that limited shell around the seed is limiting that seed from fulfilling its purpose and its destiny. And that, that, that shell needs to be broken apart and, and shed in order for that seed to fulfill the purpose that God had for that seed. It was not God's purpose that that seed remain alone. It was designed to fall to the ground and die. And bring about a harvest. See, that's what happens when the, when the seed falls to the ground and it gets buried, and and uh, the nutrients of the soil, and on and on, uh, the the, uh, uh, the something mystery, mysterious happens, something miraculous happens. It begins to break apart, and we a lot of times we don't even see it. Uh, it's it's below the surface. It's in the dark. Uh, it's a mystery, but something happens. It breaks apart. The sh- the shell is shed to the side, and the plant emerges. That's resurrection. That's not a resuscitation. Because you see what comes out of that seed, even though the DNA was all in there from the beginning, what comes out of that seed is not at all what the, was, what the seed looked like. There's lots of examples of this in nature. You know, the, the caterpillar that goes into the cocoon, when he comes out, he doesn't look like a caterpillar anymore. And, and, and the tadpole is swimming around in the little pond or puddle, uh, pretty soon becomes a frog that doesn't look like the tadpole. And the, and the seed, the little acorn goes into the ground and becomes a, a mighty oak tree. And hear me, when we understand that we're called to die and shed the limit, limiting shell, will not fulfill our purpose in God. Do you understand that? We'll, we'll, we'll not fulfill the purpose. You know, God has given this church prophecies in the past, Eastern Gate. But yet, you know, somehow, sometimes we like to hold on to that shell a little bit longer. We like to hold on because it's comfortable there. We don't have to change. We could just, we could just stay in our comfort zone. We can just hang on to, to where we're at and, and, uh, and not realizing, not realizing that the breaking up of the shell and the Taking away the limit. You see, that's one thing about the, the resuscitation is you go back, back into your limits. You're limited by fear. You're limited by baggage. You're limited by the hurts that you've had in the past. You're limited by, by all those things. You're, you're thinking. You're stinking thinking. It, uh, the lies of the enemy. You're limited by all of those things. But when you're resurrected, there is no more limitation. Jesus was able to go through the, the locked doors and the locked windows of the upper room. Why? Because it was a resurrected Jesus, not the previous Jesus. The resurrected Jesus, the resurrection life and power has no limits. We need a resurrection. We need a resurrection. But, but too often times we're tempted, we're tempted to stay caterpillars. We're tempted to stay in the, the, as a single seed or as a tadpole. Uh, you know, listen, it, no, don't get me wrong. Jesus accepts us just the way we are, but he doesn't leave us that way. But sometimes we want to just stay as we are. We don't want to change. We like it. We like to be comfortable. We like to be in control. We like... We're not growing. We have gotten comfortable with our baggage, our fears, our anxieties. 
The question is, is Jesus Lord or not? You see, one of the things about those Greeks, going back to the Greeks again, is they, their hearts were open. They were, they were in Jerusalem to find, to, to seek and to worship God. And, but then why, why did they get drawn to Jesus? Why, why did they get drawn to Jesus? They were seeking God, but they were drawn to Jesus. Listen, you, you need to understand that Jesus attracts. He attracts sinners. He attracts people that you would not, would not even think twice about. They, he attracts those people are drawn to Jesus. What are they drawn to? They're drawn to, there's something there. They're drawn to Jesus. They're drawn to the, to, to the power of God. They're drawn to the love of God. Sometimes the church does not draw. Because the world doesn't see Jesus. So sometimes we don't, we don't draw people to Jesus. Because they're not seeing the beauty of Jesus in us. You may have heard or read the illustration before of Michelangelo, the great uh, Italian sculptor. Uh, he, he, if you go to Rome today, you'll see some of his art. Well, you go to some uh, art magazines or museums, you'll see some of the artwork uh, of of Michelangelo. Angelo, great sculpture. But what they, they one story was that they would they would bring him in a big block of stone, a huge block of stone. And set it in front of him. And uh, they, they would ask him. They'd say, now how do, you, how do you go about sculpting such magnificent pieces of art? Such magnificent, beautiful figures. How do you do that? And Michelangelo said, well, I look at the stone. But I can see in the stone the beauty. I can see the beauty in the stone. And so sculpting is easy. I just chip away what does not belong. I just chip away what is ugly. So that only the beauty emerges. I I just chip away what doesn't really belong there. And, And you know, sometimes that happens in our lives where God's chipping away and We don't realize that he's trying to bring about something beautiful in our lives. Michelangelo, he had it right. The the beauty begins to emerge. And listen, that's the way it is with God. God looking at you. He's looking at this world. And he can see beauty in your life. And he's trying to chip away the things that do not belong. The things that make us ugly. Instead of attractive. Because he can see the real you. He knows the real DNA. He knows your true identity. And he's just chipping away what does not belong. He chips away at our sins. He chips away at our flesh, our soul, our self. A passage of scripture I memorized many years ago, but I love it. Galatians 2.20 says, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I allow live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Jesus attracts. Jesus draws. Jesus, Jesus in me draws people to him to Jesus Jesus in you will draw people to you Jesus in this church will draw people to this church it's when they don't see Jesus in me or Jesus in you or Jesus in this church that they are repelled rather than drawn here think about it this way the, the, the evangelism, the gospel, is all about becoming beautiful. Okay? 
It's all about becoming beautiful. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is not about uh, hitting people over the head with a Bible and dragging them to church. That is not evangelism. That is not the gospel. The gospel is about becoming more and more like Jesus. Becoming so beautiful that people are drawn. They can't help it. I tell couples, and you've heard me say this, when I do weddings uh, and we're doing wedding rehearsals and the, cu- and the bride's groom- bridesmaids and the groomsmen are all up in front and we're walking through the rehearsal and the bride is just about ready to come down the aisle. And I, I tell the wedding party, I said, now's a good time when she's coming down the aisle, now's a good time to straighten your cumberman and fix your flowers and pick your nose and do whatever you're going to do. Why? Because nobody's going to be looking at you. They're going to be looking at her. Why? Oh, there is nothing more beautiful than the bride. Now's the time the bride draws as she is full of love for the groom. I think it was Floyd McClung. Uh, he's the one that's given credit for it. He was a friend of Beth and I many years ago. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's about love. That love makes us beautiful. Love for each other. Unity. That's why Jesus talks so much about unity. Unity in John chapter 17. Unity is what reveals God to the world. When we are in unity. So our purpose is to be like Jesus. Our purpose is to be beautiful, is to be attractive. And anything that takes away from that attraction, anything that's ugly, anything that does not belong, needs to be chipped away. In my life, and in your life, and in our life. So let me ask you a question this morning. What's limiting you? What what is the shell that you need to break up? Or shed. What, what is limiting us in 2020? What is limiting this church in 2020? What is keeping us from being beautiful? So beautiful that the world can't take their eyes off of us. What's limiting us? That's why Jesus said we must die. So that Jesus emerges and a harvest unfolds. So again, what time is it? What is the hour? It's 2020. What is the Spirit saying? I hope you'll join us for this prayer and fasting time. Let me share a closing story with you. And I shared this before, probably years ago. So uh, if you've heard it before, act like you. This is the first time, okay? It'll make me feel better. Many years ago, uh, in first church I pastored, actually, after we came back from California, I pastored in Northwest Ohio in Paulding County, okay? A uh, little, little crossroads called Melrose. They had a grocery store, but no gas station. Gas station was four miles away in Oakwood. Uh, it had uh, a post office. I don't know how that happened, but it had a post office. Uh, and, uh, and one church, my church, that meant I was the pastor of that whole town. And I took it seriously. That meant that I don't care what church you went to. If you live in my town and this is my church, I'm your pastor. And I took that very seriously as I was a 20-something-year-old pastor in that time, a 30-something-year-old pastor. What that meant was that uh, I I would go out of my way. To wave at everybody. In fact, uh, uh, and talk to as many people as I could talk to. My, in fact, my kids would say when we're driving down the road, they'd say, Dad, did you know that person? No. Well, why'd you wave? I wave at everybody. I waved at everybody. Whether they were even, whether, whether they waved back or not, I waved at them. And uh, that's just the way it was in Northwest Ohio. And when I'd go to the local watering hole, which was the post office, everybody that was in there was free game. And I would talk to them and, and reach out. Now, you've got to understand how difficult that was for an introvert. That does not come natural to me. 
But I, I was determined. I was going to be their pastor. It didn't matter whether they went to church or not. I was going to be their pastor and I was going to care for them, reach out to them, talk to them, re- and make connections with them. And many, many times when I'd go into the post office, there was a young man there by the name of Tim Brown. I don't know what it is about Tim's. We got a lot of Tim's in this church. But Tim Brown was 19 years old. And uh, very often when I would talk to Tim, uh, his eyes were were blurred and red and glazed. I don't know if uh, Tim, Tim by his own account, had been drinking since he was nine years old. So for 10 years he'd been drinking. He was raised by his dad who was an alcoholic. I uh, don't know where the, the mother, where she was at in the whole equation. Uh, and uh, Tim had a bad reputation. He was an uh, alcoholic. He had bad reputation in being into drugs. Uh, he would have the wild, wild parties in northwest Ohio in Paulding County uh, that were noted for drugs and alcohol and girls. And it, you, can, you can't even imagine all the stuff that was part. Well, Tim was in the post office, and I would say hi to him every single time. How you doing? Tim uh, how's things going is life treating you okay I never I never once hit him over the head with the Bible in fact I don't remember ever inviting him to come to church I just talked to him just how you doing don't know if he even was hearing me or whether he even it was registering or not I didn't care I talked to him anyway as often as I could he wears his ball cap, dead of winter. He'd be in a t-shirt with no sleeves and uh, holes in his pants. That was, I never saw him with a coat on the whole time. That went on for a while and, and then till one night about midnight, long after I was deep in sleep, <laughs> midnight, got a knock on the door. I opened the door, I got up, I entered, opened the door and there was Tim. And he looked awful. And he said, uh, I said, are you you okay? What's going on? He said, I need to get saved. Can you please tell me how to find the Lord? What do I need to do? Beth came around the corner out of the bedroom. I said, you go back in the bedroom. Uh, Tim, come on in. And we sat in the living room and... uh, we talked for about two, two and a half hours. And Tim, during that time, Tim just spewed out all the stuff in his life. All the hard hardships, all the aches, all the terrible, terrible stuff that I didn't want to hear. But he just got it all out. And I said, so that's what brings you here tonight? Yes, because I want to find God. I need, to, I need to know Jesus. And we, we knelt down after I talked to him for a while and explained the gospel to him, explained to him how that Jesus already died for all of his sins. But he needed to receive it. It's a gift. You can't earn it, Tim. It's a gift. All you can do is receive it by faith. God's already done the heavy lifting. Jesus already died for you 2,000 years ago. He didn't miss you at all. He knew exactly about you. The moment he died, he had it all in his mind. All you have to do is say yes to him. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's as simple as that. What happens if I do? Your sins will be forgiven and you'll be saved. And we talked and after a little while, I said, Let's, I said, do you want to receive Jesus? Do you want to be saved tonight? Yes, yes. I said, let's pray. And we got down on, the knee, on our knees at our broken down old couch there in the living room with that little parsonage in Melrose. And we prayed. And Now, sometimes when I pray with people, you know, I have to, okay, I'll lead you into prayer. I didn't have to lead him. It just, he just started blubbering and yelling and hollering and go oh God I need help go oh God save me God is it true that you can save me on and he just let it all out I didn't have to <laughs> I didn't have to guide him at all he said it all now at the end of that I said to Tim I said I think it was a Friday night I said Tim Sunday's coming I said you ought to come to church 
I invited him to church. Now, you've, you've had those experiences, too, where you say, somebody says, well, I'll, okay, pastor, I'll be there. I'm coming to church. I've turned my life around. And then you don't see him. And I wondered about Tim. We were, we were somewhere in that first hymn of the opening song at that little church in Melrose. And everybody was in their assigned seats, <laughs> just like you all are. And the doors swung open and in walked Tim. Holes in his blue jeans, his ball cap on, and his t-shirt. And it was the dead of winter. And he walked all the way down the aisle. I don't know how people kept singing, but they did. Because they were all looking at him. Marched right down, sat in the front seat. And they all knew him. Sat in the front seat. Tim never missed a Sunday. Tim, Tim couldn't read. He dropped out of school. He'd made a mess out of his life. He couldn't read. One of, the, one of the little old ladies in the church took him on as a project. She taught him to read and helped him get his, what is it, the GED, GRE, whatever that is. Whatever it is. The last time I saw Tim was a few years ago, several years ago. And uh, Tim was the manager of one of Cooper's turkey farms in northwest he's a manager of one of those huge turkey farms that are up there i think they're still up there i I share all that with you because it says in first corinthians 6 19 and 20 you are not your own you don't belong to yourself anymore if you're a christian This church does not belong to you if you're a Christian. You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This morning as I close this service, you're either a Christian and you're not your own. So therefore, don't waste your life. Don't waste this year. Don't waste this decade. Don't waste another minute. It's time for a resurrection. Or, you are being drawn to him. You're either a Christian or you're being drawn to him. Because you're catching a glimpse of how beautiful he is. And so this morning, I just want to offer... In fact, I want to ask if the uh, elders and our healing rooms prayer team, would you guys come on up and position yourself across the front? I want to give an opportunity. If you want to have prayer this morning, you need a resurrection. Maybe, maybe you, it's time for you to get rid of a shell that's been limiting your life. You need to break that shell and shed that thing because God wants to do a resurrection in this new year. You need to come and to die to self, to be born again. But if you need prayer ministry about anything, about anything, you come and, and, and avail yourself of these ones who would just love to just pray for you before you go home, before you go about to the rest of your day. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name for speaking to our hearts. Lord, you are beautiful. We want more of you, less of ourselves and more of you. Lord, may we be like the kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies, breaks apart, sheds the shell, so that we might produce a harvest that will glorify you. Grant it, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. I invite you to come right now. and I'm going to give the benediction in just a moment, but you come on out. I don't want us to be heading out the door while some are still coming forward. You come on up right now. and If you want prayer about anything, come on up and have prayer before you leave today.
We'll wait just a moment. Prayer about anything. Pray about anything. You come. Some great people are up here waiting to pray for you. Twenty-twenty is a year of resurrection. Twenty-twenty is a, a year in which we're going to see a harvest. Amen. Once again, don't forget about Rwanda night tonight. I hope you can come back at six o'clock. I uh, need to let Millie know if you're able to come for the meal, so she's got plenty of food prepared. And then, of course, the prayer and fasting tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Will you stand with me? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.